Grace and peace to you, friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who lives. Amen. There's a German theologian uh, named German, uh, Jürgen Moltmann who writes almost poetically about the joy of Easter. He writes in one of my favorite sections, Easter is a feast, and it is as the feast of freedom that it is celebrated. For with Easter begins the laughter of the redeemed, the dance of the liberated, and the creative play of fantasy. From time immemorial, Easter hymns have celebrated the victory of life by laughing at death mocking at hell, and ridiculing the mighty ones who spread fear and terror around them. Easter is the feast of freedom. That's always stuck with me. With Easter begins the laughter of the redeemed. As part of our preaching series on joy, I wanted to have this Sunday to think about the deep humor of the gospel. Now, we're having Holy Humor Sunday in August, but many churches celebrate the Sunday after Easter as Holy Humor Sunday or as Bright Sunday. It's a day for jokes, practical jokes. And uh, it goes to that truth that with Easter begins the laughter of the redeemed. There is, after all, a deep humor and a profound mischief to the gospel of Jesus Christ and in our Christian life. Part of what makes a joke work is a surprise of sorts. First, we are given a premise or a setup. For example, why did the nose stop going to school? And then the punchline takes us in an unexpected direction. He was tired of getting picked on, right? (laughs) The premise sets up our expectations and the punchline subverts them. Sometimes we laugh at the surprises of life itself. Maybe you've been in a moment where you expected tragedy, but the punchline is that everything turned out okay. I remember this time when I was in high school, our youth director had a whole van full of our high schoolers, and she accidentally turned the wrong way down a busy one-way street. We see all of these cars coming at us, and she quickly swerved over to the side of the road, and as soon as we were all safe, the first thing everyone in the van did was burst into laughter. (laughs) We expected uh, tragedy, but were surprised that everything was okay. There's a scene at the end of the Lord of the Rings movies where the main character, Frodo, is reunited with all of his friends, Gandalf, Merry, Pippi, Sam, and the rest, after a long journey that nearly killed him. There are very few words in the whole scene. Instead, the scene is filled with just laughter upon laughter. I suspect that these characters believed that they would all die and they would never see each other again. But the surprising punchline was that they made it. They are alive and together. They expected tragedy, but they found comedy. That scene is an image of heaven for me. When I try to imagine seeing my grandparents or other loved ones again, I wonder if rather than saying something, the first thing we'll do is laugh. Practical jokes work in much the same way. When my family lived in Mount Sterling when I was very young, Mount Sterling, Wisconsin, my dad and a friend of his who was the pastor in Gaze Mills, the next town over, got into a battle of practical jokes. One time while we were away, my dad's friend and his wife uh, came to our house and they filled our yard with animals wearing Hawaiian shirts. This was the parsonage across from the church. And inside the house, they had snuck in and put a few other practical jokes in there. And the one that I remember is that they had put red Kool-Aid inside of our shower fixtures so that when my mom got in and started the shower, uh, this red water came out at her. The pastor and novelist Frederick Buechner says, the tragic is inevitable, the comic is unforeseeable. Growing old, getting sick, accidents, mistakes, sins, war, and death, those things seem inevitable, don't they? That's the tragic. But new life, forgiveness, health and healing, peace and resurrection, that is the often unforeseeable. And in those things, we find often the comedy of life. 
These things seem unforeseeable at times, if not impossible. I think this is what makes God such a good comedian. All things are possible for God, so God is the master at surprising us with the impossible. God brings life out of death, forgiveness out of sin, holiness out of sinners like us, friendship out of enemies. God brings something out of nothing, and all we can do is laugh. Take, for example, our first reading from the book of Genesis, the story of Sarah and Abraham. Sarah was in her 90s, and Abraham was near 100 years old. It seemed inevitable that they would never have children. But then an angel of the Lord shows up and says the the impossible is about to happen. Sarah is going to give birth to a baby boy just as God had promised to them long ago. And so maybe we can understand why Sarah erupts with laughter. God has brought laughter for me, she says. Everyone who hears what's going on is going to laugh with me. That author, Frederick Beekner imagines the scene. Their shoulders shake, their faces go red, their china teeth slip a notch. Sarah will be 91 on her next birthday, and the angel says she will celebrate it in the maternity ward. Sarah stuffs her apron in her mouth. Abraham gasps for air. Perhaps God's greatest joke, however, is the resurrection, is Easter. The women who went to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and Mary in our story, expected the inevitable. They expected to find Jesus dead and buried. But here's the punchline. God had once again done the impossible. God had pulled life out of death like a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat. Jesus is alive. He is not here, for he has been raised, the angel says. And it says that Mary and Mary flee with fear and with great joy. I wonder if they giggled at the impossibility of it all. In our second reading, the Apostle Paul himself seems to be playfully mocking at death. Where, O death, is thy victory? Where, O death, is thy sting? I think we could insert in there a little nana-nana-boo-boo at the end. (laughs) Our hymn of the day is a classic hymn of victory that joins in Paul's mocking. Endless is the victory, thou over death hast won. Some of the early Christian writers in the 3rd and 4th century described Easter as God's practical joke on the devil. Sin, death, and the devil are the butt of the joke, according to them. And so in the Easter story, in the gospel, we laugh. Today we praise because there is a deep sense of humor that brings people like us together this morning. I want to close with a poem that I wrote a few years ago. I'm not often uh, struck by inspiration, but this was a rare exception. Kristen and I were on a long car ride, and as we drove, we were reading out loud to one another C.S. Lewis's Prince Caspian, which is one of the Chronicles of Narnia. There's a scene there where the lion Aslan, who's a Christ figure in the books, liberates the town of Baruna with the children Lucy and Susan. And as they go, they make holiday. It's a scene of joy and laughter and healing. In that moment, as we read that story, I was struck again by the beauty and humor and joy of the gospel. I had a deep resonance with the laughter of the characters the laughter of the redeemed. It was so bad that I couldn't speak for the last half hour of the trip because I was trying to remember the words that were coming to me. And when I got home, I picked up pen and paper and the poem just flew out. It's called Easter Mischief. I'm keeping a list of Easter mischief. It's growing every day. I'm to start in the cemetery at the dead of night swapping stories with a crowd of caskets before hugging the dirt above grandma's grave. Then mischief has told me to loose my grudges like a herd of cows skipping out to pasture, to lay down my cares like a purring kitten. Before long, I'm to meet the little ones and the weak 
We're making paper chains to replace the prison bars and macaroni art for every permanent record. We're to sign off every bill of debt in Cran under the name of Jubilee. We're to treat every declaration of war as scratch paper and army tanks as jungle gyms. I'm to find the loneliest child, the loneliest alcoholic, and the loneliest part of myself. We're to keep going until the rest are found. Each one of us will grab the world by a corner to shake it out like a rug. Then we're to turn it upside down like a snow globe to watch the money flakes float south. Next, we're digging to the bottom of the landfill to let the soil see the stars. We're to vibrate every molecule of atmosphere with songs of thanks and praise. God told me to change the locks on every church building and to give away the keys. I'm to unpot and plant the Easter lilies in every spot of barren ground. And after all this, I'm to try to sleep, even with Mary's song in the streets and the quiet commotion of tomorrow's feast. I cannot wait to wake up. I cannot wait to hear us laugh and laugh. I pray that you too will be caught up in the deep humor of the gospel. I pray that God's joy will tickle your funny bone. And I pray that we will laugh as only a free and redeemed people can. Amen.